and again, if I ask anything that you are oh. uncomfortable with, just tell me, because I get I get a lot of that. <laughs> Feel free. I'll okay. probably be. She'll probably get on my case for being too open, but it's all good. Okay. <laughs> uh, Hey guys, I'm James Wheelock and uh, my channel is Wanderlust Estate and I chose to do the van life almost strictly because I wanted to take the opportunity to be able to travel more. It was in a period of my life where I wanted to simplify things as well. What's kind of neat about this new counterculture is it's not about just being against general society, which a lot of the other countercultures have. It seems to me to be a community and a culture developing where people just want to live a little bit more like we have in the past. They want to eliminate some of the rat race. I think it'd been, I would almost call it brainwashed into living uh, the lifestyle that, you know, the mainstream thinks that we should. You know, I doing the house, you know, having the fancy cars, and I never was really happy with that. I was proud, right? But there's a big difference between being proud and happy. And so um, this has kind of been an opportunity for me to become more happy with the way my life is in general, rather than just being proud of things that I have or a status that I hold. I haven't done cable for quite a while. And so I kind of just do Netflix or YouTube and I happened to be one day when I was having I was having just troubles with typical things in corporate America, nothing that's out of the ordinary that nobody else experiences, but things that were really frustrating with me, you know, with the politics and and the deception and 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 the wastefulness that I think and and really today it's starting to also be that you see a lot of uh, how do I put this um, lack of work ethic in and more of a situation where people are trying to seem like they're working rather than actually being productive. And so with that, and then also with a business that I had, I had a partner uh, who had ended up spending funds from company accounts. So it was just a, a real rough time line. And I happened to be on YouTube and I came across the video of Living Free, who's Mike O'Connor. And uh, his video that he said, I finally did it. I'm living in my van 100% of the time. I got a lot of negative feedback when I first mentioned it to a couple of people that I thought I was gonna do it. Um, I'd gotten some negativity from a friend of mine and then also from a, kind of a uh, referral colleague that thought that was kind of way out there. Uh, maybe even the spot where I might need a white jacket where it goes backwards. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I ended up doing it anyways. I kind of kept it quiet for most other people uh, after I got such a negative feedback. Now, I would say I'm not really around a lot of the people that speak negatively. Um, I also now have this elongated trip that I was on and all these sites and memories and a lot of them are documented in video and in photos. And so now a lot of those people that were kind of negative are like, wow, that's cool. I find it real liberating. Uh, I have done it very simply. Like a lot of people have really built out vehicles or, or bought vehicles that pretty much have every amenity in a home. I don't have that. I haven't been living that way. And uh, for me, I wanted to get as simple as possible and use the funds for my travel and then find out what I really miss and what I got to have rather than dwindling away at the normal uh, amenities, the normal luxuries, right? Uh, for me, I, I just wanna live as simple as I possibly can and not, not feel discomfort. I've always kind of think the conversion vans were kind of cool for traveling in. So I went kind of the conversion van route just because of the leather and s stuff like that rather than going straight to a cargo van. Um, I didn't even consider a minivan 
can't tell you why I didn't consider it. Uh, I guess it just didn't seem manly, maybe. I don't know. But uh, uh, I never really considered that. And the setup that I have in mind is extremely basic. I basically left it the same way it was. Uh, I did realize when I started trying some nights in the van that uh, I needed something for the Texas heat. So I made sure I had a generator and an AC unit to handle those nights. But for the most part, uh, I wanted to focus my funds that I had on taking that, the trip that I took. Uh, and so there wasn't necessarily as much planning in the selection of my vehicle as a lot of other people take to it because the center of my objective was to be able to travel more. I didn't completely know whether I'd want to stay in this lifestyle or not. Uh, I didn't know what level I'd want to be in it. I didn't know if I'd love it, but not like the van thing and want to go to an RV or something like that. So what I want to build up for, for myself is a completely mobile income. So I kind of, the concept of uh, personal finance is about having a four-legged table, right? You know, for retirement sake. Well, I want to take the kind of the same perspective of, you know, I don't want to have my income in just one basket that can be pulled away from me. I want to have those four legs. So if I lose one, it may be wobbly, but it, it's still a standing table. And so uh, my concept is to have some of the funds come from the YouTube. Uh, I am in the process of developing some websites. I hope to earn income from those as well. Some of it through affiliate advertising and then some of it through ad revenue. Uh, the next thing that I really want to do is I want to have some sort of uh, income source that is is more la it's more labor, but like for instance, there's something that I'm looking into with doing like virtual assistants for real estate agents, and I think it would be cool to be able to build that into a small business um, where I could even help the community some with it. Okay, and then I want to do some work camping. So, I, you know, some different places set up, maybe a month or two here, a month or two there, work, and the rest of the time have free, you know, f more physical work. I think that's a good base of, of income. I've actually started sharing a little more and more, you know. Um, I don't know. I think most people know. I, maybe I haven't, like, full-on disclosed what happened with me with the brain tumor I had. So there was a five doctors say that I probably must have had the tumor for about five years. So um, I kept going to the VA to ask about uh, it and um, the VA never never found what was wrong with me. They kind of had every symptom that I had brought. You know, now I know they were symptoms but of what I had, but uh, um, at the time I just brought things that I thought weren't right about myself. They kind of explained it away. You know, I didn't know any better to bring them in connection to one another. Maybe that would have helped them to stick up for them a little bit. But, uh, you know, still, still didn't, they still didn't find it. And then uh, I just, the last time I went, I just was so frustrated. I decided to go to an outside endocrinologist. Uh, and we're not talking like a real fancy uh, healthcare place. You know, it's just Kelsey. Kelsey Siebold here. So, and uh, the endocrinologist did a full blood panel on me and found that my TSH was low, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, that my prolactin was high, and um, noted that my peripheral vision was going away. So, when he saw that, he said that the number one differential diagnosis for that is a pituitary tumor. And uh, he sent me in to for an MRI, told me if it was no big deal, that uh, they'd call me in a week or two or whatever. If it was, I'd hear from them pretty quick. I went in, I did the MRI. The next day, I got a phone call, and uh, I had a three centimeter tumor. And it was in the neurohypophysis, which your pituitary gland, the upper portion of it is usually referred as the neurohypophysis. It's where your thalamus, which is your midbrain, and your 
pituitary gland, which is the, known as the master gland. It's where they communicate. So uh, I ended up going in for a surgery and uh, they removed part of it, but it didn't end up removing it all. So I went for another one uh, and did a round of chemo. Thought everything was okay. And then a few months later, uh, I had it. I had it. Uh, I had it come back. And then uh, it was in spots that they couldn't do the same kind of operation. Uh, they figured it was, obviously they'd figured out prior that it was malignant. It's not a place that they go and they just biopsy. They either remove it or, or they uh, don't. And it turned out to be malignant. Um, the next set of, I did a third surgery, which was uh, a gamma what they call the gamma knife, which is radiation, really hyper-targeted radiation that they did, and uh, um, got rid of it and put me on some pretty nasty uh, chemotherapy, which was at the time experimental. I don't really know if it's gone FDA approval or, or anything like that, but it ended up working out for me. Uh, Catalina was, that was real early in Catalina and I's relationship actually and it was pretty rough on her. And I was trying to be a tough guy too. So I wouldn't let her drive me back and forth, you know. She'd find me sometimes laying out on the floor where I, after I came home from chemotherapy. That wasn't the smartest thing, obviously. But uh, um, ended up making through it. Uh, a few months later, uh, I just, I take a cabergoline now that's supposed to help prevent the tumor from coming back. You seem to have no reservations about living mobile when you've had pretty, you know, you've had some yeah. serious issues already um, and still have some things to deal with down the road. So how do you get past that concern about... So, so first of all, if you live your life in fear, you're never going to experience anything. And I don't think you're going to be a very happy person, okay? Uh, so you need to you need to get outside of that fear. However, you do it for yourself. You really need to do that. Um, the as far as like how to handle it, you know, a lot of people act like just because you're living a mobile lifestyle, you don't have access to healthcare options, and it's quite opposite, right? I mean, really, if you're living a mobile lifestyle, you have more access to whatever healthcare options you want to take part in. You can go anywhere, right? You can take the house with you. You don't have, you don't have to worry about uh, finding a place to stay. You don't have to find, change where, how you're earning your income. Um, I mean, you don't, you don't need to deal with the commutes, right? I mean, there's all these things. It's actually, in some ways, even though it's a fear people have, it's actually easier to get that health care. Now, as far as if you actually get to the sick and where you can't, you can't actually work, do the work that you had done before or anything like that, you're still in a better place, right? Because like if you'd stayed static and you had a house and you were living in it, then you're going to, while you're sick, you're going to have to go through the turmoil and, and crisis of not being able to afford the place you're in. Now what are you going to do, you know? And before you make that decision, you're probably going to deplete your savings, right? So now where are you going to go? You can't even afford the mobile lifestyle where you have an opportunity to actually own your home like not own the right to rent it from the government, you know, which is what we do when we own real estate because of real estate taxes, right? So with real estate, as some people are calling it, um, it can go anywhere. You do actually own it. And if you get that real sick, what's the difference really from an RV, living in an RV, living in a house or a trailer, or any of those kind of options? There's not a whole lot of difference in it. <laughs>